stand all over the building, all right? Others will be coming in. We're delighted you're here. Ben Atkins, step up here and pray with us. Let's ask God to give us a wonderful day, spirit-filled day, Christ-honoring day, Jubilee day. How many has enjoyed last night? Great, great, great. Hey, I'm glad that uh, the light's still on, amen? Appreciate all the preaching, all of it. And we're looking for a wonderful day today, this morning, and then tonight. But right now, let's pray together. Remain standing, and then we'll sing a song. All right, Brother Ben, please. Lord, we love you this morning. God, we thank you for the ability to come into your presence in prayer. God, thank you that we have a listening ear in heaven. Thank you that your hand's not short that you cannot save, and your ear's not deaf that you cannot hear. Thank you, God, that you heard us cry from that horrible pit, Lord, in the miry clay. God, thank you that you picked us up and you put us on a rock and you established our goings. Thank you, God, for that new song in our mouth, Lord, that we can sing praises unto you. God, thank you for this place and thank you for our church. Thank you for our pastor. God, thank you for the men of God you've brought to preach into our lives. God, thank you for the foolishness of preaching that got to our, that light, our life one day with some light. God, thank you that you shine light in the darkness, God, and we comprehended it not. Thank you, God, that you went to prepare a place for us, and God, you're going to come back and get us, take us to that place. God, thank you for this time we can come into Jubilee. God, we give you glory and we give you honor for all that you've done for us so far. God, we look to you this morning, God, to do something for us. God, we need your hand and we need your power in this service. I ask you, God, you'd bring in the wonders of our mind. I ask you, God, you'd keep the distractions, Lord, to a minimal. I ask you, God, you'd touch the preachers as they prepare to preach. God, I ask you, Lord, you'd anoint Brother Jeff Griffith as he prepares to preach your word. God, would you give him liberty and unction from on high. I ask you, God, you'd clothe him in his calling and make it easy for him as he preaches to us. God, would you touch Brother McNeese as he prepares to preach. God, would you keep your hand on his ministry and as he travels up and down the road. Take care of his wife and his children at the house, God, and you take care of him. God, would you touch Brother Larry Raines. God, thank you for his ministry. God, thank you for old-time religion and how we've seen it work in him. Thank you, Lord, for giving us some examples and some men that went on before us. God, we give you glory for some that didn't backslide and compromise. Take the bribe and go with the world. Thank you for that, Lord. We give you glory for your honor. God, we thank you for your preachers. God, we give you glory. Lord, we magnify you this morning in the, in the ears of the hearers. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. God, we look forward to what's about to happen here in your presence. Thank you, Lord. You said where two or three are gathered. In your name, you'd be there in the midst. Lord, there's more than two or three here, Lord. And we ask you, God, you'd be true to your word. We trust you to be because, Lord, your name's faithful and true. And we look to you today to do all that you said you'd do in your word. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And we look forward to what you're going to do for us here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 338, 338. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not as much for me he died.
come in. Others continue to come in. We're going to get some singers in place. Cross the aisle. Tell somebody, don't go to the bathroom. You should have already done that. Tell somebody you love them, all right? Everybody's going to find a seat. Let me have all the men of God stand again. We've got some new preachers here, and we'd like to recognize all of the Lord's men tonight, right now, and then we'll have a song, and then we'll have a message in a minute, all right? All of God's preachers, all right? Evangelists, missionaries, pastors, let's get good and loud, find out who everybody is. Right here, Brother Shane. God bless you, Brother Shane. God bless you, Brother Joey. God bless you. God bless your heart, brother. Go ahead. God bless you. Amen. That's three missionaries to Japan. Isn't that great? Go ahead, Brother Rains. Yes, sir. God bless you. God bless you, Brother Flora. Luke Lindsay, evangelist from Livingston, Louisiana. God bless you, Brother Jeff. Jeff Rivers, Somerset, Kentucky. God bless you. John Spooner, Big Creek, Kansas City. Moses Frazier, the MC Baptist Church, Salt Lake City, Utah. God bless you. Rich Swallow, Mountain View Baptist. God bless you, Brother Love, right here. Jimmy Elder, Sons of Frank, Grand Rapids, Iowa. God bless you, Brother Elder. God bless you, Brother Dean. God bless you, Brother Robbie. Yes, sir. God bless you. Amen. Appreciate it so much. Thank you for these local men being here. It sure means a lot. This Mark Jordan family, we're going to let them sing one. We're going to turn our first preacher loose, all right? Love 
Sometimes you men know what I'm talking about in your church services and, and folks get excited and get happy and enjoy the Lord and enjoy worshiping and, and preachers agging on. You know, you have visitors there like brother talked about last night and their eyes get about that big. And I've literally seen some walk out. But you know what? We're undaunted, amen? Undaunted. I'm glad I'm saved, amen? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Snatched as a firebrand out of the burning. I believe it's worth getting excited about. And not only getting that way, but staying that way. Brother Jeff, come on, all right? This is my brother in the flesh and my brother in the Lord. And I'm glad God saved him out of a terrible, terrible life. I've used him probably as much as anybody in my family as an illustration most recently when he smart-mouthed smart -mouthed my mother. And my mother took an ice chest and popped him right in the chest. And I say, thank God for mom. <laughs> I love to tell those stories about him. Good stuff, good stuff, all right? But you don't do that anymore. Come on, preach for us, all right? Preach up! He probably did that on Mother's Day, too. I won't talk about what I did on Mother's Day. <laughs> I was preaching in Mount Vernon, Kentucky about a month ago at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church on a Monday night in revival meeting. And I'd never preached along these lines in a revival meeting, never. And I told my wife, I said, I'm a little bit nervous. I, I don't preach like this in a revival meeting. And I preached on that Jesus tasted death for every man. And I had about 30 of our own people there because our choir went over and sang. And when I... I got started, I knew it was going to be a little different just because I never preached in that area before in a revival meeting, not on a Monday night. And 
the Lord really helped us, and we talked about, you know, when he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, the beginning, I believe that was the beginning of him tasting death for every man, yeah. the cup in the garden. And I walked us through the events of the crucifixion of Christ, and an unusual spirit of God settled over the building. And, I mean, it was quiet, and you, I mean, it was, the pack, it was a full house from front to the back. And I knew that God had just, in the very beginning, sat down on the service. It was, so, it was so thick, Brother Dean, that at the end of the service, the pastor got up and he said, and he just walked and he said, I mean, you could hear the pin drop at the end of the service. And he said, Preacher, you've made me feel bad. That's what the pastor said. And I knew what, what he meant was, I mean, you could feel the conviction. In my closing statement, I said this, he's done a lot more for us than we've done for him. And you know how at the end of a service, people are fellowshipping and talking and laughing and have and nothing. I mean, you thought somebody had just died in that building. And I started looking around. I said, I got to get out of here. I said, I, and just quiet. My people were here, and they remember that. So the pastor said, preacher, join me at the door. And I went to the back door, and I was standing there shaking hands. And nobody wasn't saying, oh, great, man. It was just, you could tell that God had took us to Calvary. And a little old white-haired lady, one of them old Kentucky back porch screen door, spit tuned Kentucky women come by. And she looked at me and she said, Preacher Griffith, I've never heard Calvary preach like that. And I, and I was waiting and, and I said, well, ma'am, I, I don't think I've ever preached it like that either. And I said, I won't let that go to my head. She said, don't worry about it. She said, it won't go to your head. It was in your heart. Here's what she said, preachers. She said, and you had him on you, and now he's on us. And she went out the door, and I, it dawned on me. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It dawned on me that we're supposed to bring the message that God puts in us. And when they leave, they're supposed to have it. Thank you. I want to say thank you, first of all, to all of you for your prayers in our present situation. I'm not going to bring that up, but I want to thank you. I felt your prayers. We still feel you praying for us. I don't know from day to day how things are going to end up. Uh, I'd like to keep my church from fragmenting. That's what we are. We're pastors, but I am not going to apologize to anybody for the Bible. For the Bible. Not going to do it. I want, I want the people from Denham Street to stand up. I want all you Denimites to stand up. I want you all to know that I love you. And I thank you for driving five hours to be in this meeting. Thank you. You may be seated. You didn't have to come and there was supposed to be a bunch more with us. So now I'm going to tell all y'all, if y'all don't come to my jubilee, it might be just me and them. <laughs> and that's not very good out of 300. <laughs> but I tell you what I have. I have determined not to let others walk through my mind and leave, and leave dirty footprints. That thing wore me out about two weeks. I thought I was going to end up in the hospital. And God said, son, you better get a handle of your mind. Yeah. I went and visited one of my old men, one of the older men in my church, and he's got a head of white hair, and he put his hand on my hand, and he said, Pastor, be still. Yeah. Amen. That's all he said was be still. I got in my car, and I run home, jumped into bed, pulled the cover up about that far, and I just laid there for two hours. And I felt stress and pressure leaving my body like I'd never experienced. And I kept hearing the Holy Ghost say, be still. Yeah. Be still. <laughs> every day, every day, God give me something else. Every day, God do something different for me. And uh, the next day, I was sitting on the mower. And you know how these things, they go around in your mind over and over. And I was thinking, Lord, this isn't worth it. You know, I've got a comfortable salary. I, I just, I, I've been here five years. I don't want to move again. I'm just not into this stuff. Lord, settle this thing down. And he said, son, I'm talking about on a zero-turn lawnmower through all this racket and noise. I'm trying to find the peace of God. And the Holy Ghost said, son, 
You remember that book of martyrs you read? Fox's book of martyrs? Yeah. And I said, yeah, Lord, I remember. And I said, but I'm cutting the grass, and I don't want to hear all that nonsense right now. <laughs> I need you to do something for us. He said, you remember the trail of blood you read in Bible college? You remember that book? I said, yeah, Lord, I remember that book. He said, do you know, do you know that man, John the Baptist, that you preach about? Do you think you're any better than him? So I come off that zero turn mower, I threw that thing to the side and I jumped off. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not any better than them. Hold the line. Hold the line. John the Baptist was doing fine. You ever thought about John the Baptist? Think about this. He was an isolationist, whether you don't know that or not. John was not a man that liked a crowd. He preached in the wilderness on the outskirts of Judea. But he was such a man that people would go from out of town go in town, go out of town to go hear John the Baptist preach. And John the Baptist preached repentance and nobody minded. But the moment he tried to lift a moral standard in a man's life, they cut his head off. I've been preaching for five years, repentance, ain't nobody bothered me. But the moment I start dealing with situations of modesty, modesty, just modesty. All right, we need to get on with this, don't we? Some people think in order to fix themselves, they got to break you. Don't get critical. Don't get critical of people. Just, you haven't walked a mile in their shoes, you might. I've been saving something for 34 years. I just thought it would be a good time. Had a lady, had a lady leave my church about two years ago and it got back to me because I saw a letter that she wrote. And she said, I don't like it when he calls his brother his pastor. <clears throat> She's no longer with us, so don't worry about it. This is, this is 34 years old. Dear Jeff, I trust and pray that this letter finds you doing well. So sorry to hear of your recent misfortune. I was incarcerated for driving under the influence and driving without a license. I said I was incarcerated. I want you to know that we still love you and are praying for you. I sure wish... I sure wish you could come up here and stay with us. Jeff, can I give you some truth? <laughs> and I want you to think about it, okay? First of all, I want you to go back to the night you got saved there at the church. Well, if you meant that, and ask the Lord to come into your heart, you're still saved. You belong to God. Amen. Ever since you got out of church, things have gotten worse and worse for you. Makes me sad to the point of tears to see my brother down and out and in trouble. I guess you call that family love. Amen. Every step for you away from God is a step down. Things are bad now, but things will get worse unless you turn to the long-suffering Lord. <clears throat> Jesus always cares. <sighs> mm. Jeff, why don't you give up the world? It's pleasures, sins, and my what heartaches. Whew. All it gives is pleasure for a short season. Then what? Trouble, misery, sorrow, broken homes, finally death without the Lord. God has been so good to me, he supplies my every need. He gives me many, many friends to help me. There is a peace in my heart, rest in my soul. I'm satisfied with Jesus. Yeah. 
You have tried everything else. Now try the Lord. And you'll have to look at the grammatical construction of this to really get it because he's got underlines, hyphens, question marks. I mean, he was preaching when he wrote this float. He said, remember this book you once read, and the book was uh, the, the Black, Oliver B. Green, the, the Black Sheep of a Respectable Family. And he said, remember this book you once read, and it was a blessing to you. Please read it again. It might encourage you. I'm praying for you each day. Please write sometime. Soon. Thanks. Love, Steve. And then he put, P.S. Think about all I wrote. Here is an envelope and a stamp. And on the side of the first page, he put, here's $10. To buy you something, the underline, eat. I love my brother and I love my pastor. Been, been saving that for 34 years. Never shared it with anybody but my wife. Just taking care of me. This was, this was written in March the 3rd. Soon after that, they had the Tampa Baptist camp meeting. I think about, Brother Rains, was it the third week in March every year? They had the camp meeting in March. Steve was the pastor of the Open Door Baptist Church in Easley, South Carolina. Chuck was the Sunday school superintendent. I was in trouble and away from God. Steve had a prayer meeting. He said, Jeff's going to come out of the room. This is all told to me later. Said He came out of the room and said, Jeff's going to be all right. Wrote the letter March the 2nd or 3rd. Had prayer that week or week after. Come out and told Chuck, Jeff's going to be all right. I got word they were all coming to camp meeting. I said, well, I'll go to camp meeting. First night I was there, Brother Larry Raines preached on the call to Carmel. Yes, sir. Brother Raines, thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> 35 years later, I'm pastoring a Baptist church. I have five children who go to church every time the doors are open. I just got my third grandbaby, and that's why I'm here this week. <laughs> God's been good to us. I thank you. I thank you, those of you who have invested in me. One verse this morning, Nehemiah chapter 8. And I, I, what time did I start, Pastor? I, I want to I stay within 30 minutes. I really want to do that. Is that Denham Street laughing? In the 8th chapter of the book of Nehemiah, very familiar, verse number 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered. Do it with me. Amen. Let's do that again. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered. Amen. With the lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about one word this morning and it's called amen. Just simple amen. I was in another revival meeting and I heard a man, he preached along these lines and I thought, man, that's, that's a good thought. So I took it home and worked it over. You know how you do preaching. You write something down, take it home and you just kind of develop it to make it your own, but you're really stealing from him. So I stole it from him and put my twist to it. But I want to preach on this thought this morning. Somebody say amen. Now the word amen simply means, and we know this, so be it. It's an expression, an expression of agreement. 
That's all it is. It's an approval of what's being said. It means a sure, trustworthy, let it be established. Now the world has stolen this word, amen. Very quickly, what kind of word is the word amen? I believe it's a common word. Amen is a very common word. You can find it at the end of most prayers. You can find it at the inaugural prayer of a president. You can find the word amen being used throughout our society in many venues. It's a common word. The closings of church services, statements and ceremonies, it's a common word. It's a commissioning word. In the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark, when Jesus Christ began to close his life and told the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the last thing he put on Matthew 16 and Mark was amen. It is a commissioning word. It's a common word and it's a commissioning word. It is also a completing word. Did you know that the word amen is the last word in the word of God? It's a completing word. In other words, when God got done with his Bible, he said, amen. Hey, boy, I like it. I like that word, amen. It's a completing word. And not only that, but according to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, under the angel of the church of Laodicea, right saith the amen. Think about that. It is a church word. And that's what I want to deal with this morning. Amen is a church word. The world has taken this, this word and misused it. But I like church language, don't you? I know something about church language. And I think amen is a church word. I can prove that because if you study the Pauline epistles, you will find out that Paul wrote in the book of Romans and the last word of the book of Romans is amen. The word amen is found in 1 and 2 Corinthians. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, he concluded those two letters with a word called amen. If you study on, you'll find out in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews, all of them end in amen. I'm preaching on somebody, say amen. You're supposed to say amen. Uh, this isn't deep, y'all. This is real simple. Amen's the easiest thing you can preach. We were in camp meeting one time and Mickey Hoyle preached on the map, so I figured, what's wrong with preaching on amen? He said, my salvation, the assurance of my salvation and peace with God, and he preached on the maps in the back of the Bible. This is a church word, First and Second John. He concluded those letters with amen. The book of Jude concluded with amen. The book of Revelation concluded with amen. I would have to say by studying the New Testament that the word amen is a church word. Do you agree with me? Can I give you four things about amen that should be done at church? I want you to go to Numbers chapter number five. This is very quick now, very quick. Numbers chapter number five. And I want you to uh, go to a verse that's found. I'm going to begin in verse number 15. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her the tenth part of the nepha, a barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of a memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And here it is. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take the holy water in the earthen vessel of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. The priest shall take and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, 
amen, amen. The word amen is a word of witnessing to us. Now understand this, this is, a, this is a situation where a husband has a suspicion about his wife and her unfaithfulness. And in the Old Testament, how they dealt with those kind of things, it's laid out for you. He would have bring this woman to the priest and he would bring this bitter water and pour it on her. And, and if, if her belly rotten, the thigh rot, then she was guilty. And in order for this to happen, the woman would have to pledge with an amen, amen. And what she is saying is, let it be so. And may I say this to you and I this morning, God has every biblical right God has every right to examine our lives. God has every right to pour the water of the word of God in us, around us, and through us, and all we ought to be saying is, amen, amen. I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular, but I can tell you this, that the woman simply was to answer, amen, amen. I say the word amen is a witnessing word or an examination word. As a matter of fact, the Bible said in Psalm 139 where David said, search me, O God. Search me and know me. Psalm 119, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto unto thy law. Woe be unto us. Woe be unto every one of us who refuse to allow the word of God to examine our lives. I like this. This lady just had to simply say, amen, amen. It's a church word. It's a word of warning. Go to Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy chapter number 27. I want to show you this. It's a word of witnessing. It's a word of warning. Now, I'm going to do this, and I want you to help me, okay? When I get to the word amen, I want you to answer it. I'm going to begin the reading in verse number, in chapter number 27 of Deuteronomy, and I'm going to begin in verse number 14. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and put it in a secret place. All the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth a light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife because he uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say. Cursed be he that lied with his mother-in-law and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person and all the people shall say. Amen. Cursed be he that confirmeth to not all the words of this law to do them and all the people shall say. Amen. This word is a word of warning. Warning. God says if you do these things, you're going to be cursed. I'll tell you nowadays, people don't want you to tell them anything. This is a word of warning. The word curse means to be, to be deserving of a vexation. I still believe in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that word, amen, is a word of warning. God says at the end of those warnings, I want you to agree with me on this subject. I want you to further say amen to it. It's a word of witness. It's a word of warning. And then thirdly, it is a word, I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter number one. This is just a simple thought. I just wanted to come read my letter to my pastor this morning. 1 Kings chapter number one. 1 Kings chapter 1, look in verse number 32. And David said unto, and David said, Call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Jehoah. And they came before the king, and the king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and call Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gion. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there, king over Israel, and blow you the trumpet, and say, God, save King Solomon. 
Then you shall come up after him that he may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaniah, the son of Jehoiah, answered the king and said, Amen. Amen. The Lord God of my Lord, the king, say so too. As the Lord hath been with my Lord, the king, even so he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. It is a word of willing compliance. Willing compliance. One king is leaving the throne and another king is ascending the throne. Some people don't do very well with changing of authority. Some people cannot accept that God raises men up instead of other men in other places. And this word, when, he, when David begins to, to step back from his throne and to put his son on his throne, Solomon, uh, the, the men that are present, they have an opportunity for revolt or rebellion, but instead they say, you know what? Whatever you say, King David, if you want him to be our king, I'll let him be my king. Oh, thank God for the happy day in my life when Jeff came off the throne and Jesus ascended to the throne. I want you to know that there's a king in Jerusalem, hallelujah, and he lives in my heart by faith and I'm here to tell you that I have no problem with authority in my life. There's a new king on the throne, amen. Amen. man. They, they simply, they Jehoiah answered the king and said, Amen. And I've, I've had my share of folks who have authority issues. <laughs> I mean, they don't want you on the throne because they want to be on the throne. It's really, I found out this, it's not, a, it's not so much authority anymore. It's called attitude. People, just, people nowadays just have a nasty attitude toward authority. And I believe this. I literally believe this. If you have a problem with pastoral authority, you'll ultimately have a problem with God's authority. And if you have a problem with God's authority and pastoral authority, you'll no doubt have a problem with parental authority. And that always leads to police authority. Have you ever seen such a generation that doesn't respect authority? I said, I said to a policeman one time the wrong thing, one time to one policeman. They were driving by our house. We were all a bunch of project kids living out there in Tampa, Florida, and a policeman was coming by, and, and I hollered, Hey, pig! We called them pigs back then. That pig slammed on the brakes of that patrol car, slammed on brakes, jumped out, and he was about six foot nine, black as a Hershey's candy bar, <laughs> ran right up out of my face. All my buddies took off bicycles flying. He ran up to me and he said, now that I'm real close to I look like a pig. And I said, no, sir. I never said another bad thing about authority. That took care of my authority issues real fast. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe Jesus deserves the right to live on the throne of our heart. I believe he ought to be the rightly ascended king. And when God wants to dethrone you or dethrone something you're trying to hang on to, you ought to say amen to it. Whoever God wants to put on the throne, you ought to be willing to say amen. Let me, let me close with this. Let me, let me close with this. Uh, this, is, uh, this helped me in. And I hope it'll do you. It's a word of willing compliance. It's a word of warning. But it's also a word of worship. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a word of worship. Psalms 41, verse number 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. 
and amen. Psalm 89, 52, blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen, amen. Revelation chapter one, verse number six and seven, and hath made us kings and priests unto God our Father. To him be glory forever, amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth which shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. It's a word of worship, hallelujah. I'll never forget this as long as I live. Myself and Brother Steve and Brother Chuck. Steve was the pastor of the Open Door Baptist Church. Chuck was the associate uh, song leader. I was the yard cutter, the, the cook, chief bottle washer. And when we wasn't eating at the ranges on Sundays, I was making pinto beans and cornbread every day of the week. We lived in the parsonage. We decided to go to a revival meeting over at the Washington Avenue Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. We walked in the door. It looked like the three musketeers. It was Steve, me, and Chuck. I was green. Chuck was green. And Ch Steve was 20-something years old at the time. We walked into the Washington Avenue Baptist Church, and we sat somewhere around the middle on the right, left side. The place was full. It was one of them old Southern Baptist churches. Dr. E.J. Daniels was preaching. And I mean, that old Southern Baptist man was like the J. Harold Smith of the Southern Baptist day. And that old man could lay it out there and preach it, buddy. And we were just kind of, man, we were going from camp meeting to revival to jubilee and fired up. And Steve's the big time pastor, pastoring 30 people at Open Door Baptist Church. And Chuck was the Sunday school superintendent and I was the yard grass guy. And we were having a big time. We slip into this revival meeting and we sit in there about the third way. And I mean, you could, you could hear grass grow in that place. It was so dead, it was so quiet, it was terrible. I looked over at Chuck, I said, man, we gotta help this preacher. I said, we got to help this preacher. I said, amen. When I did, every head in the church started looking around. Steve sunk down in his pew and he said, you boys stop it. Y'all stop that. Don't, don't. I'm telling, I'm telling the truth now. Son, I saw, I saw that old preacher when I said, amen. He, he, it sparked a little spark of divinity in him, buddy. And he said something else and I said, glory, hallelujah. Steve said, y'all stop it, stop it. They're going to throw us out of here. They're going to throw us out of here. And I mean, people were looking, they were trying to look around and see who was making all that racket. And boy, that just fired me and old Chuck up. Your pastor done slid underneath the pew. He's going, they're gonna throw us out of this church. Y'all better behave. And old Chuck and me, we didn't care. And old Chuck would say amen, I'd say glory, hallelujah. And we started revving that old man of God up. Here come the ushers down the back. The ushers come out of their positions. And this is what they were doing. They were walking down the church and they got about three quarters of the way and they were doing this. So they got about three quarters away, and the old Dr. E.J. Daniels looked at them old ushers coming down the aisle. He said, hey, you old deadheads, leave them boys alone. Let them worship God. Woo! Glory to God. I tell you what we did. Uh, we amen that old man that he about preached out of his clothes. Hallelujah. I say amen is a word of worship. I like amens. We shouldn't have to have an amen corner. I want amen church. I want an amen choir. Amen Sunday school teacher. Amen. Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah for amen. <laughs> they never did throw us out of there. We never forgot it. It's a worshiping. It's a worshiping word. Let me close. Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. Under the angel the church of Laodicea write. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Whew. Psalm 72, 18, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who doeth wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever, and the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. I said it's a worshiping word. Wow, you're not gonna scare me with amen. <laughs> Revelation chapter number five, verse nine. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book 
and to open the seals thereof if thou hast, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hath made us, made us unto God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I beheld, heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was about 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto that sitteth upon the throne and in the lamb forever and ever and the four and the four beasts said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever it is a word of worship I don't care. I don't care how far I have to drive. I don't care what I've got to do. I've got to be in a place where I can worship God. I take an amen over a hand clap any day. I'm sick of this hand clapping nonsense. I clap for entertainment. I say amen for worship. I say amen for examination. I say amen for a willing compliance. Woo! Hey, I like old fashioned preaching. I like old fashioned word of God. I like church language. Church language. Mm. One other pass, one other thing I want to read. It blessed me. And after this I beheld a lower great multitude which no man could number. I believe that's us. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped, saying, Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor. Amen unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Whew. One more verse. I tell you what, this word amen, it got real big when I got to reading it. Here it is, Revelation 19, 4. And the four and 20 elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, amen. And they said something else. Hallelujah. Woo! I don't mind a little hallelujah every now and then. Now y'all remember when I said the word amen is a common word? You know it's only pronounced two ways, right? One of them is, Amen! The other one is, Amen. Come on. Amen. Nah. I like it in church language. Amen, preacher. Lay that word of God out there. Examine my life all you want to. I've got the right king living on the throne. You ain't gonna bother me. I'm gonna say, let it be so. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I say, Amen. Amen. We're going to do a congregational. Get that other preacher mic'd up. Give that to Brother McNeese, if you will. Get him mic'd up. Get him ready. Let's stand. What number are we singing? 202. Everybody get a book in front of you. Let's sing it, all right? 202. Good song. Good song. Amen.
thank you again for being here. We do not mind a bathroom break. We do not mind that at all. We don't mind ladies going to the nursery. We understand those things. And matter of fact, we appreciate if if little 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 ones, you know, creating a ruckus, we don't mind a nursery a bit. Amen. But uh, and we do have some folks keeping that. Appreciate all of you being here. This is Evangelist Dean McNeese. We sure love him. Appreciate him starting our meeting out Wednesday night. Did an outstanding job. And, and we wanted, I told him you know, a long time ago, he was going to preach him twice during the meeting. So let's give him undivided attention. And I told him we're going to get to another preacher in a little bit. I know I kind of stay in high gear, but I, I think most of you are here for preaching. I really do. And, I, and I'm glad. I'm glad. And by the way, I say amen to that. Preacher, come on. God bless you. Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. amen. Revelation and the first chapter. Yeah. Hadn't the Lord been good to us? Yeah. Revelation and the first chapter. I went last night and to help at a teen camp that my brothers got an hour south of here. And I went to uh, pray with the Manly family. Uh, it'll be the last chance I get to see them. And last night we laid hands on them and Good. prayed for Good. Ben and Chelsea and the little red-headed girls. Well, They're flying out next uh, week and this will be the last chance. So, And then I heard that Brother Fleur and Brother Arthur was preaching last night too. So I just went on down there. <laughs> and... Uh, No, I want to tell you something. Uh, that message Brother Fleur preached on Calvary. Uh, I'm a, it's been 15 years probably. And the Lord gave us that message on Calvary. Yeah. Yeah. I know, that's so precious to my heart. And I appreciate Brother Arthur. Yeah. The Lord has raised him up yeah. and sent him out across this country. Yeah. And Brother Joe Arthur has been consistent. Yeah, sir. And he's been a Christian. Yeah. And, and he, don't, he don't get sidetracked. He just keeps no, being no. a blessing Amen. to the Lord's people. Amen. And I love, I love these men. Thank Amen. God for them. We got some of our World Harvest Baptist missionaries here, and I want you to go look at our website, whbmissions.org, and uh, see them. Brother uh, Jeff, is he back? There he is. You know what Joe Parsons said about amen? And it was demonstrated a while ago. Brother Joe said that the, the church is a body and said they'll all say amen at the exact same time. Who told them to do that? How does that happen? How do them flocks of birds, 10,000 of them at the same moment, you know? And he said the Holy Ghost is a one holler. You know why we're hand clapping, Brother Jeff? Because the church has lost its voice. I, I'm against absolutely any and everything that smells like it has been anywhere in the neighborhood of contemporary. I personally think the contemporary movement was a clever plot designed in hell to run through God's church. Not just America, around the world. I was at the Vatican and the Pope's even got big screens up. And I got news for you. The last time we seen handwriting on the wall, and I, and I, and I got friends tell me to quit picking at little things, but, but, but little things are a big deal. The last time we seen handwriting on the wall, God was fixing to bring a kingdom down. I'm just, I, I've been in them inner chambers with them old men and I can't consider nothing else. And Joe Parsons said that, that the church, it's a body, it's, it's, it's the Lord's bride. She'll say it at one time. And you ever get a nut or an oddball, you ever get somebody give it a trumpet giving an uncertain sound? They'll be hollering by themselves at the wrong time. It's one of the ways I taught my preacher boys and my young preachers that how you, you know when God moves in and he takes over, 
And up here in upstate South Carolina, y'all need to be letting the Lord take over a lot more. All this. And I know Brother Griffith's for it. But I'm on. And I tell them, one way you know that the Lord's done with the service is the nuts will pipe up. Can Grandma sing it? I want to say a word. They're restrained under the power of God. And as soon as the Lord ebbs his, is that the right word? As soon as he backs off a little, then they're no longer restrained. And, they st- and I taught my preachers, as soon as the nuts pipe up, shut it down. Now, I've got a philosophy and I've made more enemies than friends in my ministry, but that's all right. I'm determined in my services when I moderate the red field and anything else. I'm determined in my services. I'm willing to hurt anybody's feelings except the Holy Ghost. And if you go with him, you're going to hurt a lot of people because people are flesh. And man don't ever need to be in charge of nothing. And you'll have to hurt their feelings in order not to grieve the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you a funny story. Now, the pastor didn't give me a time limit. He just said, make sure Brother Rains gets to preach before lunch. And he wanted, he wanted that order today, and we're going to honor the old warrior back there. Uh, I got, you was talking about you get that preacher worked up. <laughs> this is awful, and I should not tell this, but I'm fixing to. And uh, I'm, I'll be 50 on the birthday after that. I love Brother Benefield. He's one of my favorite. The greatest sermon preached in this meeting was Brother Benefield when he thought I was in my 30s. I like that. I like that. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I called Jennifer. Hey, you're still married to a young man now. You better... Yes, sir. They think I'm in my 30s over here. I'm booking him for everything that I got. Amen. I'm booking him to come lead my family in prayer over dinner. Amen. And... So I shouldn't tell this, but I'm fixing to. <laughs> it's awful. Kids, don't, young preachers, go to the bathroom or something. You don't need to hear this. I got a preacher worked up one time. I could, it was awful what I'm fixing to tell you. On, my, on our honeymoon, I was already pastoring. I went to Bob Gray School in Jacksonville, and they let me go pastor my last year, and I did graduate. And uh, uh, I was a preacher's kid, so I had to stay in church. You know, my entire life, Independent Fundamental Baptist. Then I went to Bible college. You got to be in church there like eight days a week, 25 hours a day. And then I became a pastor. And so uh, it turns out when you pastor, you got to be at your church. And, you know, so on my honeymoon, they gave us two weeks, me and Jennifer. And I went to every church imaginable except the Baptist. I said, I want to, I need to know what these people are doing. We went to an Episcopalian church. I went to a Catholic church. I shouldn't tell you all this. We went to a church of God. I went to, I wanted to experiment. I've been preaching against them, don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> we got an Episcopalian and they were doing the, their version of communion and we was all supposed to go kneel down here and the guy was, uh, uh, you know, walla ball. I'm like, oh, baby. We've, <laughs> we're going to start this marriage right with an Episcopalian communion. Our pew stood up. I said, y'all, children, don't ever do what I did. But, and then we just, everybody filed down there for the priest, and we filed out the side door. And it wasn't a side door. It was a storage, something or other. And we come back out and went out. <laughs> well, Brother Galloway, on my last, this is awful. I apologize to the Lord. He wouldn't say nothing about it. I don't know if it was bad or not. He wouldn't talk to me. But we slid in. We was in the smoke. <laughs> we slid into a Southern Baptist. You could tell it was liberal. You know, you can just tell by driving by. You can look and know. And uh, we went, last service on a went. We was heading back. And I wasn't dressed for church. I had on blue jeans. I hadn't shaved. But it was Wednesday night. And it was a Southern Baptist church having a revival. And so we slid in and I sat in the back. And I tried to hide a little. I looked so bad. Well, that Southern Baptist evangelist, he 
he thought he had him a sinner. An old rough boy in the back slouched down. Well, I figured out that he thought I was a sinner needing, and so I just helped him. I have never been in that role in my life. And I enjoyed it, so I hunkered, I, I glared at him. He laughed. And poor fella, he'd been, these people were older than death and time. They couldn't even hear him. They like, eh, uh, you know. He had somebody to preach to. I thought I was helping the cause of Christ overall, even though, it, you know, and I just, I glared at him. He'd bear down. He was coming up. I looked sideways. <laughs> it was great. We slipped out at the end and left. I never touched. Somewhere. There's a Southern Baptist evangelist fired up in his ministry. I, I'm an illustration somewhere, I guarantee. That old boy left, never, I don't know where he is tonight. <laughs> I've contributed to his ministry in my own way. So that, that blessed me. I enjoyed the fire out of that. I have never been an old messed up sinner on the back row, but I enjoyed it. I, it was great. I helped though. They probably went a third, fourth week. That boy got fired up. Yes, sir. Amen. All right, All right Brother Rain, I'm going to make sure we treat you right. Lord, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for Jesus. Lord God, help me for a little while. Lord, just for a little while to feed your sheep to honor your son. Oh, Lord, to be energized, leave here energized with the gospel. Help us in Christ's name, and we love you for it. All the Lord's people said. Amen. I want you to go to Revelation chapter one, and I'm just, this is what the Lord put in me. I knew that just a slot, and I usually have to preach a burden out of my heart, and this, so I, I struggle, but this is what the Lord put in my heart, this passage, and I just want to look at it and see if the Lord will help us for a moment this morning. I'm reading Revelation 1, verse 4, and I thought, Pastor, in the spirit of Jubilee, that I'd just go look at Jesus for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See if we can celebrate around that. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Revelation 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. I felt me a little happy bubble just then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Mm. Mm. Unto him that loved us yeah, yeah. and washed us. Yeah. He loved us first, yeah. and then he washed us yeah. from our sins yeah. in his own blood yeah. and hath made yeah. us. Yeah. He made yeah. us. Yeah. Follow me, and I will make you. Yeah. He made us and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. <laughs> Amen. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, yeah. saith the Lord. Mm. That's 10 minutes I got off of it. <laughs> which is and which was and which is to come. Mm. The Almighty. Yeah. Bless the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to exhort until I need to quit. Yeah. The Almighty. Yeah. You know where you find the Almighty more than anywhere in the Bible? If I was going to give, if I was God wanting to display my title, the Almighty, I would have done it in Genesis with, with, with my creation. 
I, I, I would have done it in the Gospels when Christ, the Christian, the anointed one, came doing miracles, ahead, raising the dead, walking on the water. I would have done it in Revelation, controlling time and events and all the worlds that are. I would have put it in Revelation, the Almighty. But do you want to know where the Almighty is? More than all the other books of the Bible put together. It's in the book of Job. The book of Job. Them 42 chapters of great tribulation is where the Almighty, the Almighty, when the Lord said, you want to see all my might? I said, yeah, let's go to Genesis and look at it. He said, no. You want to see all my, you want to see when I'm almighty? I said, yeah, let's go to the gospels and see the miracles. Let's go to Revelation and see you're wrapping up time and eternity. He said, no. <laughs> if you want to see all of my might, come over here and peek in this door. When my best servant, undeserving of this treatment, is on the floor and the devil's beating the slop out of him. And I ain't doing nothing to stop it. I ain't, I ain't even telling him what's going on. And he thinks there's a lot wrong with him, but this is all happening because there's so much right with him. That's where the Almighty. I'm going to tell you something. I'm independent Baptist, front and back, top to bottom, but we are eat up with Phariseeism. And we need to get over that. We need to look around and realize, every one of us, that we are a big old messed up mess. And, and you ought not ever look at nobody that anywhere in any mess and think you're different than them or better than them. The reason we don't worship in our churches and say amen because we don't th really think God done much for us. We was all a messed up mess. and, and the, We was all clay out of the same part of the horrible pit when that nail pierced hand reached in there and got you. He could have got anybody, but he got you. You ought to thank God for it. There ain't nobody deserve the blessing of the Lord. You look around and see who's doing what and who did what. You better get over that. God knows you. He knows me and he knows you. I don't know how I got off on that, but I got off on it there for just a minute. We're all sinners and you better get over yourself. where the Almighty showing himself. That's where he's in. And he wouldn't even do nothing to fit. And he wouldn't even tell Job what was going on. Yeah. You know when he showed up? You know when he showed up? I'm just going to exhort till I need to quit. You, you know when he did show up? Job's on earth saying, what is wrong with me? He done some cussing too. You go there and read it. He cursed quite a bit. And, and, and all this. Boy, he was tore, slammed out of the frame. And carried on. And every day, agonizing, beating himself up. What's wrong with me? And over in heaven, God's standing there saying, See, I told you, he's the best one I got. Ain't he doing good? That's what he said. He said, in all this, he's sending. Boys do it. I knew I could count on him. He's down there wondering if he's saved. Wondering every other verse, if God's, what God, what's happening here. You know Ray Lindsay that pastored your old church down there and built that? He's sly. Ray Lindsay that built that church. And Brother Laddie pastored over there in East Chattanooga before he went to Tampa. Ray Lindsay, when they, he said, when you bury me, you'd open that Bible. And that was his request. He told his wife and family, and put it on my chest and put my finger on Job 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And after my skin worm destroyed this body and my flesh, I shall see God. <laughs> At 10 minutes of preaching, I just flung off of me. And, uh, oh Lord, and God's in heaven saying, I was the best one I got. And I, and I knew I could count on him. He's down there saying, Where's God? Am I saved? What's happening? What in the, is going on? My goodness. And, uh, oh, Lord, and there he is. And the Lord said, boys, I'm going to go talk to him. I'm so proud of him. I love him. 
Do you know there's no young preachers? Did you know there's no more ancient piece of literature in the sacred or the secular world? I don't know what burned down in the library in Alexandria, Egypt, but there's no more ancient piece of literature. He wrote that before Moses ever did. Yeah. In the book of Job. Job. That's right. And the greatest question man's ever had in humanity is why do, why do bad things yeah. happen to good people? Why does evil in the world? And the first thing God ever gave us was the answer to all that. Yeah. 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 I like what Dana Williams taught us. He said, you got the wrong question. What a good thing. I mean, what a bad things happen to good people. He said, you got the wrong question. We need to be walking around asking, why do good things happen to us bad people? <laughs> Dana said, that's the only question on the table. And I'm trying to figure out why these good things are happening to us bad people. And the Lord said, I'll be back in a minute, boy. I'm going to go talk to Joe. I'm so proud of him. He's holding true and I knew he would. I'll be back in a minute. And he come down there and chewed him out. Stand up. Gird yourself like a man. Which tells you how men and women ought to dress. Gird yourself up like a man. Stand there. I got some questions. And he asked him 77 questions. He didn't come with any answers. <laughs> All Job wanted was answers. God's so big and sovereign. You can believe in the sovereignty of God without being a Calvinist. Stinking outfit. Don't get me started right there. 20 minutes of preaching right off of me right there. That, that, that won't turn loose so easy. Uh, uh. He just showed up and said, I got 77. Where were you? When I laid the foundation. <laughs> Heaven's above, hell's below. I'm sorry, boy. Where were you when I laid the foundations? It's like my daddy. I know he loved us, but when he come in our four of us, but when he come in our bedroom, he whooped every one of us, no matter who was in trouble. <laughs> I think he had the trouble to go up them stairs, Brother Joey just whooped all of us while he was up there. <laughs> Went back down the stairs. Oh, my. I'm okay. What about that? I hadn't thought about that this morning. I just seen it right there, the Almighty. That's where God's Almighty is in your suffering. He ain't even moving. He's just watching. He makes sure Satan don't go too far. He get him a double portion. He get him a double portion gathered up while you down there flailing, beating the earth. <laughs> Woo! Fixing to sign my own Bible. There's a back leaf of it just so I won't forget this occasion. Not out of ego, just so I don't forget. I've signed four of y'all's Bibles while you wasn't looking. I got Brother Fleur and Brother Dove. My signature's in there, but y'all went to the potty and I signed both of you back. Signed them all. I knew you wanted me to at some point. Let's talk about John for a minute. Talked about Job. There's another suffering man. Let's talk about John. No, oh, no John right here. John the Revelator. I mean, we talk about that other one too. I like him over there. I love John the Baptist. Good. I love him because he's a Baptist. Oh, I love him. Six month ministry ended in seeming failure. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, I like old John over there. He went down in them death waters with Jesus. He's the only man that ever seen the Holy Spirit. He's the first one to see the Lamb of God and know he was the Lamb. He saw the Holy Ghost and the Lamb of God in the same moment and he was standing in them death waters when he did it. That's why we ain't never seen nothing. We ain't never went down in the Jordan with him. Isn't that what Elijah told Elisha? If God lets you see it, he's going to let you have it. But you ain't going to see nothing until you get in them death waters. 
<laughs> we can talk about any John you want to, Pastor. I like John the Baptist. He saw the Lamb of God and the Spirit of God. Them two things missing in our independent Baptist churches if we ain't careful. Yeah. Neither one of them creatures will fight you. Yeah. <laughs> it's New Testament, boys. We don't win this with, with weapons. You don't win the battles that we're in with uh, fighting. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I don't know what you're going through, Pastor. There you alluded to. I don't know what you're going through. But just lay down. A dove. Got no, what is it, no gobbler. Don't, the dove don't retain any bitterness. And the lamb can't fight you, won't fight you. Oh, John the Baptist looked up. Mm. He saw the Spirit of God like a dove. The only man ever seen the Spirit of God. And, uh, and the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God was in his arms when he saw the Spirit of God. We need the Lamb in our arms and the dove coming down on us. We didn't learn how to have church without God. Something's wrong with us. Upstate, y'all better be careful. Proud of all your great churches, y'all better be careful. You have your thumbs in your spenders just like, what was it? They had a name that they live in, but they're dead. They might be having a little better church down in the low country because them people are more poor. Talk to me. We having everything in church except what church is supposed to be. The Lamb of God and that dove. I can't hardly, it kills me to have church when it ain't got the lamb or the dove. I can't hardly, it's killing me. I'm grieved back to the point of death in my soul. Great Chinese pastor, I forget his name. Great Chinese preacher came over to America about 20 years ago. Out of that persecution and that, some real Christians going on over there. When they got back and they asked him, they was all excited about the American church. They said, tell us about the American church. He said, what amazed me about the American church is what all they're able to do without God. I don't want to settle for anything less than the lamb and the dove. Hmm. All right, I'll say three things and I'll head, we'll head for the runway here, try to land this. I love that John, he said, which is and was and is to come. And he got down there again in verse 8. I'm half and make but he is and it was and was to come. Isn't the beautiful thing how the Lord let him stand in all three of those places? That's why he could write about it. John stood at the beginning of time. He stood at the end of time. And he stood where time divided. He stood at Calvary. Y'all talk to me. How, how does John 1 begin? In the beginning. Ain't nobody else that we know of ever got to stand there except Moses. Do you know John's the only disciple they couldn't kill? They martyred all them other boys, didn't they? They couldn't kill John. He's the only one that went to Calvary. You can't kill folks done been to the cross. You can't kill folks been to the cross. John's the only one. John's the only one went to Calvary out of all them disciples. Mm. What about John the Baptist buried the law and John the Beloved opened up grace? You like that, Pastor Steve? I'm going to start calling you Pastor Steve. It's more of a modern feel to it. The 
kids would relate more if we called you Pastor Steve. <laughs> Children, don't do it. You get a whooping around here. Don't y'all dare do it. That's three things that I've done today you should not do, okay? Don't do what the preacher said that day. John stood at Calvary, looked at the Son of God. And I think because of that, the Lord rewarded him. He said, because you, you stood in the middle. I'm going to show you the beginning and the end. I love John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, Moses stood right there, and God let him look forward in the time. In the beginning, he saw creation. He saw it in first days. But somebody tell me what John said. In the beginning... I'm looking for the next word, just one word. In the beginning was God stood John in the beginning, cupped his thumb under his chin, right there in the beginning. He says, no good. Yeah. You know what he saw? When he turned around and looked into eternity past? In the beginning was, that's all he's saying. That's all there was. And then God took him to the end. Do you know if you'll pay the price in the middle? <laughs> he took him, took him to the end. And old John's on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's day. You gotta ask Brother Wampler what that prophetic stuff means. I call Brother Joe and get make sure when I'm in a prophecy something, I call it because I still don't know where Armageddon. He's told me ten times. I don't know if it's in the millennial or the tribulation or the day before the rapture. I'm still confused, but I call him, he helps me. I was in the spirit on the Lord today. And God let him see. Look out there into eternity future. What a reward. Well, I brought five points. I ain't gonna, and sure enough, never did get to it. Ain't that something? I was going to enjoy that. I tell you what he did see out yonder. He saw me and he saw you. He saw that other world. He saw the other side. I got a little glimpse of it myself here and there. I'll tell this story and I'll be done. We give Brother Rain's time to help us. I was 13 when the, whole, the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost. May have got saved right there. I'm not sure. Wow. I'm not sure. I was nine when I came to him. I was 13 when he came to me. Wow. I figured if I'd have died in them four years, I, if I wasn't saved, I was safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with not having a day. It ain't a day that saved me. It ain't a prayer that saved me. It ain't a church that saved me. It ain't an experience that saved me. I know in whom I have believed. I ain't, a, I ain't a lick worried about what happened at 9 or 13. I know what happened at Calvary. <laughs> I'm about to put on your ice cream suit and go get me an orange push-up sherbet. Mm. 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 Got filled with the Holy Ghost, went back. Daddy is pastoring in the foothills of Tennessee. I bless the Lord. He turned, Brother Joey turned down a great old big rich church in Sandy Springs, right between Charles Stanley Church and that Joseph Yebedin. And the richest part of Atlanta, on the north side. Brother Joe pastors on the south side of Atlanta. <laughs> Daddy turned that thing down. God knew all them heroin needles was going to be in that rich neighborhood. Yeah. I'd have grabbed the first one I'd ever seen and I'd have been gone. Daddy took the little one block church with no floor, no windows up in Tennessee. <laughs> Wasn't no heroin needles up there. It's pine needles. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, I may have run and y'all missed it. <laughs> Felt like I was running for a minute there. I'm not even sure if I was. Uh. We had neighbors there in Tennessee. 
Sam and Della Young, old saints. Hey, old timey saints. I'm sorry, y'all. I got plugged in on the old stuff. Yes, yes, yes. These new little modern sissy old Steenish boys. No, sir. No, sir. Mm, leave me alone. Mm. Sam and Della. Sam died. He is an old deacon at the Barnard Jesus Baptist Church down on the Conasauga River. Yes, sir. Barnard Sons of Thunder. They just went ahead and named it. Sons of Thunder Baptist Church. Can I get a witness right there? There's some men went to church down there and some ladies. Bone orgies! Mm. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't lose your testimony there chewing tobacco or dipping stuff. Matter of fact, if you didn't, it hurt your testimony. What's wrong with that boy? Is he a homosexual? What is he from New York City? I know some of y'all worried about your testimony with cigarettes and tobacco. Some of the places up in the hill, it'll hurt your testimony the other way. If you bring an educated man in here, what's wrong with him? Got his teeth, uses an outline, won't use the back of that. Get him out of here. We need a real man of God. Y'all are really they need to understand your subcultures. <laughs> Sam and Della. Pretty sure he chewed and she dipped, and there's more Holy Ghost in that house. Wow. Old timey mountain people. He died. We'd walk down there one mile. The only television I ever watched growing up would watch The Price is Right. Had old black pot-bellied stove in there and a pie on it and cornbread inside it and Sister Della. <laughs> Had the Sunday paper out there and the cartoons. Only TV I ever saw was watching The Price is Right. That's where I learned to give an altar call. Come on down. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed if they ain't leaping and jumping and running when they, I mean, I, I want to see the evidences. You know, it's got a little influence there, maybe a little off the rails, but that's where I learned. Sam, yeah. If you ain't coming happy, you probably need to go back to your seat. You ain't ready. I grew up where they sent you back to your seat. You back to your seat. You're playing games at halfway. Get on back there. I walked in on Sam died. That old deacon at Barnard's. Well, we'd always just walk in, wouldn't knock. Me and my little brothers. Walked in that back porch. She had them green beans hanging on the clothesline. Leather britches, isn't that what they called them? Until they got black and the sweetness actually come out of them, they could cook. Mm. Walked in, and I walked right on in. Of course, you could walk in people's homes those days. They got up and put clothes on in the morning. They didn't have all manner of sin happening in the house. You could walk in. Now don't now don't walk in my house because I don't, I'm not that old timey. <laughs> If it's been a long, rough revival night, I may or may not be appropriately and modestly. I'm old timey selectively. I got a few issues. I walked in, she's standing in that kitchen crying. I was 13. She had one of them old black cassette tape players, and she was playing the song the last time. Her and Sam sang in church. <laughs> Her and the Lord was in there holding each other, having church. She said, this is what Sam sang. He didn't say anything for three days. He said he rose up on his deathbed right before he went to heaven and started singing this old song. He said, it was the last song me and him sung in church and she was playing it and a weeping. I just stood by her, just a gangly kid. And stood there and we had church. <laughs> I done been filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about John got to see out yonder. And honey, me and you are headed for out yonder. We are. He ain't going to give you no answers in this hour, but he's going to give you anchors. You don't need answers. You'd, you'd hurt yourself once you figured this thing out. 
You don't need answers, you just need anchors. The Lord showed up with Job and gave him some anchors. <laughs> he said, I've got the answers and I'll keep them. Let me give you some anchors. This generation so messed up, they got no answers. But they don't need answers. They need to run to that cross and get some anchors. I stand there with an old saint of God who had some anchors in her life. This is what she is a singing. I stood there with her and we had church. <laughs> said he rose up on his deathbed. Someday when I've traveled my last I charge extra when I sing, Pastor. <laughs> Just to clarify. My hear the call will be coming for me. I'll hey! mm, I'm in that kitchen with her. I'll enter the lifeboat. That, that's why I can't get in with these homosexual Southern Gospel boys. I can't get in with these homosexual contemporary boys. Don't need, don't need not one thing they got. Mm. And he'll hold my hand as over this river I go. And then safe I'll be in beautiful heaven I know. I don't remember the words, but that ain't gonna hinder me. My bark shall sail safely Though the waves dash high For Jesus shall be at my side You still the rough water When by and by I'm crossing the river so wide And he'll hold over this river <laughs> I go and then safe I'll be in beautiful heaven I know I'm going to tell something I want the ladies to hum ladies can you hum how beautiful heaven must be mm -hmm. Hum, ladies, would be that would be humming. <laughs> Y'all don't know how beautiful heaven must be? It'd be a time. I'll fire the whole lot of you. Hum, blessed assurance for me. Hum louder. You know what that bark is? I pastored in a naval town, Jacksonville. Had four sailors in my church. They said that bark was the little ship when the big ship needed to drop somebody off to the shore. The bark was the little ship because the roughest, the roughest part of the journey is the last part up on the shore. That's where the waves and the rocks. And said the big ship would stop out in the big waters. But the captain would get down in the little ship and the captain himself would take them over. <laughs> Keep it up, ladies. Perfect submission. Dana Williams said, you're going to die like you lived. However you live is how you're going to die. <laughs> I'm glad John saw the other side. I'm glad there's another side. And I'm glad every once in a while the big ship pulls in, but the captain's the one that takes them over. He's the only one to trust. Make sure they make it safe. Help them sing. This is my soul.
So glad you're able to be here this morning. I told my wife, you know what I love about all this? Jubilee, camp meeting, Red Field, it doesn't matter where we go. All of God's preachers are unique. All, nobody's a clone, nobody's the same. And if everybody was the same, Brother Laddie, I guess we'd all get bored. Everybody's unique, and I appreciate it. We're going to take, listen, five minutes, okay? Shake his hand, shake the other preachers, Brother Jeff. We're going to turn the reins loose in just a minute. We're going to go to 1230. Take five minutes, all right? Come play for us, Lauren, all right, please? Thank you, preacher, and thank you for the great preaching. Thank you. Lauren, come play, baby, please.
Let's bring it in, all right? Let's bring it in, everybody. deck mic. Verse, Miss Lauren, one more verse. Everybody's gonna get a seat. Come on, let's get the doors. Brother David, if you'll get these doors. Brother, uh, Brother Rick, if you'll get that door for me, or somebody. I think. Thank you so much. How many enjoyed being here already? Yeah. Now, we don't want nobody leaving, okay? We got grilled chicken, baked potato. Uh, I'll get, I'll get that in a little bit. We got an excellent meal planned in a little bit, and we want our preachers to stay. We want our local pastors to stay. We definitely want all of you to stay. We're no problem. We'll go all the way to 1230 if we have to. We, we are. We are. I want to give this man plenty of time, and I want to say before he comes, that this is a, a one individual that is, is as responsible for many of us in this building being in the old time way as much as anybody I know. And uh, this is, uh, we used to be Pastor Larry Raines at, at Pleasant View Baptist Church of Taylor, South Carolina, I think maybe 37 years, 36, 37. And now he's in evangelism and is extensively used all over the place, but we love him dearly and appreciate him. His precious wife, Miss Norma Rain's here. He's going to close out our morning, and we can sing all day again, but we're just going to go ahead and get to the preaching. We'll sing some of you special people tonight, so be ready. This is Pastor Le Brother Larry Rain. All right. Preacher, come on. Turn your mic on. Amen. I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter number three, please. Ephesians chapter three. It's an honor for me to be here. Appreciate and love the preacher and love this church. I believe I met the preacher it was early 70s. I was trying to figure what year it was. When you were saved the first time. 76. Long time ago. We're out of the same home church. And uh, I was out about three or four years before Brother Steve came through there and got saved by the grace of God. Wish we'd have been there together. But we've had a lot of good times, and I don't have time to tell you a lot of introduction or stories, but uh, the preachings helped me to, uh, in the meeting. Brother Ezel preached about that ball glove, and uh, he said that was a 1941. That was the year I was born. If you had two ball gloves, would you give me one of them? <laughs> I told my wife I got a baseball bat up in the upstairs, and uh, it's got the blonde bomber written on it. Wow. 
I played baseball from a little league clear up through the police department about six years. I was going to bring it, just set it up here and uh, tell him what I'd have done with his fastball. <laughs> if he'd have thrown it within reach of that blonde bomber, amen. But I'm not the blonde bomber anymore. I guess I'm the gray grounder out or something like that. But, uh, I'm glad I'm saved and I'm glad I love old time religion and I love the church and I love this book. Still believe in it, still try, try to live by it the best I know how and uh, still married to that silver headed lady back there on the pew. About 57 years, I met her when she was about 16 and it's been good, amen. I slept till about six this morning and I got up and uh, about 6.30, came out of the bedroom and uh, she was coming out of my study where she'd been in there praying. We will give an invitation if you ladies want us to give it. I knew what she had been doing because she had been with Jesus. And you can't get around him without something showing up on him. Hallelujah. Well, I could run to Goobertown, but I don't have time. I don't have time to get into all that. Amen. Ephesians chapter number three, I'm not going to get through. I will honor the pastor. I believe in pastoral authority, don't you? And I will quit here in a little bit. Miss Range, if I go over 1228, call me. And uh, no, I gave you my phone. Uh, Ephesians chapter number three, verse number one. No, I will. Uh, the Lord's given to me about four messages out of Ephesians 3, and I'm not going to preach all four of them. I'll probably mess all four of them up, but uh, I do want to give you two or three thoughts, and I'll be through uh, this uh, morning. Verse number one in your King James Bible. For this cause, I'm interested in the cause in verse number one. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, I turned two pages, I don't want to get over into the other chapter. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, here's the mystery, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. You reckon God hid that from Moses, Brother McNeese? Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Verse 10. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint. Well, I'm probably not going to get down this far uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, Paul was uh, praying about himself in the first part of this chapter that I want to preach. And then he's praying the same thing for the church in verse 13. He is praying, wherefore, verse 13, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your, uh, your glory. For this cause, there's my word again, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven is and earth is named. So he's praying in verse number 14, down on both knees in verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, 
that, here's the first thing, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. He's praying for the church at Ephesus that they might experience the enabling power of the spirit in verse number 16, how we need that today. Verse 17, that, second that, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's the indwelling presence of the Savior. In verse 17b, that you being rooted and grounded in love. That's the enlightening purpose of the Scripture. Verse number 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes the knowledge. Here's the that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, the infilling purpose of the salvation, I guess. Get full of God. Verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, that verse is the most misquoted verse in the Bible. Now unto him uh, that is able to do exceeding, not exceedingly, but exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. And Brother Jeff, they said, Amen. Would you ask God to help me, Father? I love you. Thank you for the hand of God that reached further down, Lord, than I could have ever reached up. Thank you for saving me by your grace, keeping me by your power. Thank you for the call of God upon our life and letting us serve you all of these years. Father, I'm keenly aware tonight, today that I stand where no man would ever dare stand alone. So if you will clothe me in my calling these next 30 minutes or so, illuminate my mind, revelate my heart, and give me the message you would have this congregation to hear, and please work in our hearts to the glory of God. And we'll love you and thank you now for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do throughout the remainder of the meeting. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse number 1 and verse number 14. In verse number 1, Paul, of course, is writing to the church at Ephesus. We are well aware of that. And he said, for this cause. I want to preach for a while on Paul's cause. Paul had a reason Paul had a cause, Paul had something happen in his life, and he said in verse number one, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Then in verse number 14, he said, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm not going to get down that far in my message or text and my thought. I'd love to just do an exposition of chapter number three, but we won't have time to do that. Uh, for time's sake, I want to try to preach to you for a little while on Paul's cause. God gave the Apostle Paul something worth living for. And there's a couple different ways and applications we could make. Uh, in the thought this morning, Paul had a cause, and that cause changed his life entirely. We know Saul of Tarsus had got born again uh, on the Damascus Road, got born out of religion, formal, dead, dry-hide religion, and got born into the excitement and the burning fire of the Holy Ghost movement in the early church. Amen. And I thank God for the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But as I study this chapter and God began to deal with my heart, I wonder why Paul had a cause that he had and why he did what he did and why he lived the way that he lived and we could go from his, I think he got born on the road to Damascus. Some folks don't, but uh, it don't hurt you to be wrong sometime. Amen. But nevertheless, he finished his course with joy. And neighbor, he got a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me, not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. He never lost sight of the Lord Jesus Christ after he got born again. And that's, uh, I think that's the key to Ephesians chapter number 3. Look with me please in verse 17 and verse number 18 and 19. We'll look there uh, for just a second, give you the foundation, and then give you four little thoughts and I will be through. Verse 17, he said to the church at Ephesus, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. I'm interested in that rooted and grounded in love. 
may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I believe the Apostle Paul was filled with all the fullness of God leaving that in his context and the reason he was is because he had an undying love for Jesus in his heart. I mean, it was love at first sight. When he got a glimpse of him on uh, that uh, day on the road to Damascus with warrants in his pocket and he bumped head on, had a head on collision with Jesus and neighbor had changed his life and he fell in love with him. And the Bible said, taste and see that the Lord is good. I got a message I like to preach on love at first bite. Amen. I'm glad, praise God, when I got a taste of the grace of God, I have never been the same since that day. I'd venture to say that everybody had, has ever met the Lord Jesus Christ fell in love with him. Amen. I'm afraid we got a generation coming along. There's something missing in their life, and I think it's a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just fall in love with him. That's why I'm still with that lady back there. I fell in love with her when I was a teenager, and it just gets sweeter as the years go by. Amen. And so Paul was trying to get the church of Ephesus back or get them in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that love has to grow. It was puppy love when I saw my wife back in 1959. It was puppy love. But thank God it's developed now in a whole kennel full of love. Amen. And I got my third, uh, my grandchild here in the service or was a while ago. But I guess she still is. But nevertheless, love is a growing thing. And you won't get many uh, uh, tapes of Brother Range preaching on love. But I want to get to it in just a minute. But he fell in love with Jesus and he's trying to get the church to fall in love with the Lord. May God help this generation to fall in love with Jesus. Amen. And I got a lot of scripture I could give you if I had time. In uh, Matthew's gospel, chapter number 30, uh, 22, uh, Jesus is there and he had silenced the Sadducees and uh, the Pharisees, this lawyer stood up and he said, uh, what uh, greatest of the first of the commandments of the law and the prophet? And Jesus said something like this, the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he said, and by the way, he said, the second is like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. So everything in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation 22, it hinges on love. Thank God for a love God put down in my heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad, neighbor, I got rooted and grounded in the love of God. And I probably won't get that far, but he said get rooted and grounded. And we're farmers and country people. We know what getting rooted and grounded is. You get it grounded, it's not going to wilt and blow away. and It's not going to be destroyed by uh, little things that come along in our life. Amen. The love of God is greater far than any problem I've ever had or any circumstances I've I've ever been confronted with the love of God goes deeper than those things. They're outward neighbor, but I'm glad there's a love down on the bosom into my soul that has withstood every storm I've ever had in the last 52 years of walking uh, the road with Jesus. Amen. And so Paul fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's where I'm headed when I quit uh, here in about uh, 20 minutes or 18 minutes. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 14, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, The love of Christ constraineth us. If one died for all, then all were dead. And if all were dead, then we which live should not live our lives unto ourselves, but unto him that loved us, died for us, and rose again. Amen. If you're saved by the grace of God, your life ought to be sold out and dedicated to the cause of Christ. And you can't do that apart from a New Testament local church. Amen. As one of my family said, he's working with a felon. He said, uh, well, I'm not, I don't have 
a church home. We've got home church. I said, yeah, and you ask him about that T-I-T-H-E and you'll find out there's not any scripture in his heart about tithe. And amen. That home church crowd that's forsaken the assembly of, and I'm trying to be sweet, forsaken the assembly of themselves together. It's that almighty dollar and the love of it that's the root of all evil. I'd hate to think I was in this auditorium this morning and I love filthy lucre more than I love Jesus. Amen. I hate to, I thought I loved pleasure of this world more than I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him, don't you? And because he loved us, we ought to love him. That ought to be an everlasting, overflowing love and that's found in the word of God time after time after time. Let me tell you what love will do for you like it did in the apostle Paul. Paul wrote to young Timothy in his first epistle and he said, son, he said, God saved me as a pattern to them that hereafter should believe. And so I think I can take the life of the Apostle Paul in not only his conversion, but his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to live every day of his life from the birth until they severed his head apparently at Nero's chopping block. He would live a life for God committed to Christ, give everything that he had, count it all but dumb that I might gain Christ. Amen. Here's what it did for the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God. That's chapter number 5. Amen. Chapter number 3, verse 1. That will work too. 5, 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentile, the love of God that Paul had in his heart for Jesus, it made him a prisoner. I call him Paul the prisoner, and he's referred to that here. Paul the prisoner in verse number one. Look in chapter number four and verse number one. Therefore the prisoner of the Lord. He was not only a prisoner of love, but he was a prisoner of the Lord. And he used that several times. They had him incarcerated, and his nephew, his sister's son, uh, Paul uh, said, uh, he, Paul, this young man heard him talking about killing Paul, and they was 40 of them, Brother uh, Jeff, that had made up their mind they was going to kill him, and they said, we're not going to eat or drink until Paul is dead. Well, he lived several years after that, and I never read where any of those died. Amen. I don't think their commitment to praying and fasting was too important. I believe about the third day they got so hungry, they said, we better go back to the negotiating table like President Trump and Feng Min Chu or whatever his name is over there in Singapore. Amen. I don't think any of them died because they wasn't committed to the call. But I'm glad Paul was committed. Amen. And he said, in verse number one, chapter three, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Love will make you a prisoner. I'm a prisoner of love. If I was the biggest Billy Kelly and could sing like Brother McNeese, I'd rear back and sing you a verse that I'm a prisoner of love. Maybe we ought to get the King James boy to sing one of them. Amen. When I came to Jesus, I settled it all. I gave him my life to control. Neither fear nor persuasion could draw me to Christ but his love has captured my soul if the love of God ever captures your soul it will make you a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ amen preacher you're getting old you about to quit I'm about ready to refire praise God and re-enlist and make up my mind that old time religion is not just the best way it's the only way and spiritual worship in an old fashioned church is about the only thing that's going to satisfy you and we ought to get over the entertainment and get back to worshiping God. Amen. Paul the prisoner in verse number one. That was his call. It made a prisoner out of this man that was a well-educated learned man. They said he spoke in seven languages. I don't know how they come up with all of that. But nevertheless, Paul learned to love the Lord Jesus Christ, got rooted and grounded in the the love of God and it made a prisoner out of him. I wonder how many of us would fall in the classification of being prisoners. 
And I don't have time to labor any of these points in Ephesians chapter 3. But I'm telling you, if you ever become a prisoner, I was in law enforcement for about six years, and I've been on both sides of the bars before I got saved and after I got saved, Brother Jeff. But nevertheless, a prisoner is under the complete control of whoever he's in prison to. Are you listening to me? And they're demonstrating for their rights and they think they ought to have cell phones and they ought to think they ought to have visitation by the harlots and the women of the world and we're depriving them. I'm telling you, when they're committed to sin and give their life to a, that cause and give themselves neighbor for wicked and ungodliness, they forfeit every right that they've got. Amen. I used to give traffic tickets and I don't like to get them any more than you do and I used to investigate traffic accident and somebody would say uh, he violated my right of way he pulled out in front of me but they were running a hundred mile an hour they were violating their own right of way are you listening to me that violating the right of way ain't gonna hold up in court if you're running 30 mile an hour over the speed limit I mean, your right-of-way just covers that little short distance in front of you. You're overdriving your headlights. I don't have time to preach on headlights and taillights and turn signals and everything else that's going on today. But a prisoner has forfeited his rights. Are you listening to me? And when you come to Jesus, Paul told the carnal Corinthians, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Amen. God save me, body, soul, and spirit. I never that soul is sealed under the day of redemption. My spirit is quickened and made alive and want to get out of this cage I'm in. And thank God this body is to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then our salvation will be complete. We know it's complete now, but I wait to wait the redemption of my body. And I'm leaving this earth, praise God, and get a glory body, fashion like his glorious body, what a day that will be. But a prisoner has no rights of his own. I know this new generation, they're brainwashing our young people and these colleges, may God help us, amen. I don't believe too much in home church, but I'm pretty well persuaded about home school, amen. And I don't have time to get into that. But I'm telling you this uh, afternoon that we don't have any rights after we get saved. We have forfeited our rights and probably in this congregation today, the majority of it ought to find us a guest and fall on our face before God and pray more earnestly than we have ever prayed in our life. Father, not my will, but thine be done. Our Lord did that. The Apostle Paul did that. And I believe the church ought to do that this morning. Fall in these altars, God, not my will, but thine be done a prisoner and I could talk to you about prisoners I know a few and I pastored a few and some of them been through here too as well amen but I'm telling you a prisoner has forfeited his right and somebody's going to tell you when to get up when to go to bed, where to stay, where to go, what to eat, how to dress, how to adorn yourself, how to take care of your hair. They're going to tell you everything about you. State of Georgia, if they haven't changed it, your hair couldn't be over three inches long on your head and it could not touch your collar. Now you'll have to check and see if that's still so or not. Uh, this fella killed a bunch of people here in the upstate and buried seven or eight of them there on his property around Spartanburg somewhere. He's suing the state for violating his rights or whatever. I think they ought to send him, bless God, to Siberian salt mine somewhere and put four balls and chains around his arms and his feet and make him bust salt blocks with a sledgehammer. Are you listening to me? Where'd you got the love of God in your heart? Well, I raised a family that I love and I had to rebuke and straighten out them once in a while. Your pastor loves you if he does have to rebuke you. Are you listening to me? 
We are prisoners. We should be prisoners of love. Paul said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The young nephew went to him, and here's what he referred when he talked to the fellow that was going to be in charge of taking care of Paul and getting him out of town and maybe taking him to Caesarea, wherever he was going. I didn't read that today. But he said, Paul, the prisoner, has got something to say. And so he had a conversation with Paul, the prisoner. He was a prisoner of love. Look with me, please, not only in verse 1 at Paul, the prisoner. Look in verse number uh, 7. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Not only Paul the prisoner, but Paul the powerful. May we get the power of God back on our life. And I know it's not in volume. It's probably one of the most abused and misused uh, doctrine in all of the Bible is the power of God. It's not how loud we are or this, that, or the other. But I'm telling you, it's having the Spirit of God in your life and letting God make a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the Master's use where God can use you for a purpose we'll see in just a moment. But Paul was a man that had to power God on his life. We need to get the power back on the church. We need to get the power of God. I think they're in order in this chapter. If we become a prisoner, we're subject to become powerful in the things of God. You young men, surrender it all, whatever it is, hook, line, and sinker. Give it all to God. Doesn't matter what it is, throw in the towel, run up the white flag. He's Lord, you're his prisoner. He saved you out of the quagmires of sin, brought you up out of a horrible pit, set your feet on a solid rock, I put a new song in your mouth, even praise unto our God. Get the power of God on your life. Surrender to the Lord. You won't regret a mile that you ever travel for the Lord. Paul the powerful. We know he talked about being filled with the Holy Ghost in this same book in chapter number 5. But look in verse number 8. I like this. We've seen some of it around here. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He was a prisoner, he was powerful, and in verse number eight, he was a preacher. I'm telling you, it didn't matter where he was, it didn't matter what was going on in his life, you lock him up down in Philippi, and he'll look over to young uh, preacher uh, Silas, and he'll say, Silas, uh, how about hosting off a verse of that, uh, how beautiful heaven must be? How about hoisting off a, a verse of that amazing grace, how sweet to sound. How about lifting up a, voice, a verse of that, nothing's impossible with God. And I'm telling you, they started singing and a praying and a worshiping God. And you know the rest of the story, the power of God fell in that jailhouse and the foundation were shaken. And the Bible said all the prisoners, that's every one of them, they all must have been... Uh, not part of this uh, doctrine that's sweeping Baptist churches, and I don't have time to get on all that mess, but every door in the prison was open, and they all had freedom to get out of there, and Paul said, brethren, we're, uh, uh, we're all here. Don't kill yourself, Mr. Jailer. We hadn't run. God's got us here for a purpose. I'm telling you, I don't know how many of those uh, Philippian uh, prisoners got saved, but there's a whole crowd of them got saved by the grace of God. God, and they may not have been a tubal choir. They may have been the jailhouse choir. I used to preach in the jail when I had time, when I was a pastor and every now and then, and you get them fellas in there, and they get to singing, Swing low, sweet chair I'm going to carry me home, swing low. I couldn't stay in that jail house. Yeah. They get to shouting and praising God. They look rough. They had the right tune. Amen. Yeah. Are you listening to me? And maybe some of them got saved in there. I hope they did. We had one or two converted. Had one raised from the dead there in Tampa. And I don't have time to tell you that story. They, they said, that that's it. I mean, call the mortuary. They're dead. Well, we just had enough faith. 
fell on over there and began to pray. They started batting their eyes and got up. Amen. We probably don't have that kind of faith now, but are you listening to me? He was not only a prisoner and he was not only powerful, but he was a preacher. If he woke up in the midnight hour, way back down in the inner prison in Philippi, where the roaches and the bugs and the rats and the mice and everything else was, it didn't matter to him. Pray God, just wake him up at three o'clock, slap him in the face with a wet wash rag, spin him around three times. He'd say, did I ever tell you about the Nazarene saved me by the grace of God? He would, you shipwreck him on an island somewhere and he'd win the chief and half the island to God before he got off of there. Put him on board ship and he'd say, brother, don't worry about this ship. God told me there's not a hair of your head going to perish. We are going to shipwreck. Are you listening to me? And that ship went down and there wasn't nothing floating but wigs and cigars, but they all made it safe to shore. Are you listening to me? Paul was a soul winner. Paul was a man that had the power of God on him and Paul was a preacher. Now you don't have to act like me to preach, but I've got one gear and that's the only gear I got. It'll be a happy day if we ever come to the place where we're not all Brother Biddles or we're not all Brother McNeese's or we're not all some other preacher. Just be what you are. Just be what you are. You'll reach people I could never reach. My son has got his master's degree. Most of y'all know him, uh, members of this uh, place. And he gets in places while they wouldn't let me lead in silent prayer. But every now and then I'll get in one, praise God, and get to walking on about six inches in my cuff leg, my shirt tail hanging out, and my hair down in my eye. I won't reach it because I, I do my own hair. I cut my own hair. I was cutting it uh, last week, and I got, I can do pretty good. I've been cutting it since we started the boys' home. We couldn't get enough money, so we, I couldn't afford a haircut, so I did it myself. And I had them clippers up there, and I dropped it. And it hit right there. I went clear to the bone. I whole gob on my hair, but I said, I'll meet you in the morning by the bride. So I've combed it back, I've combed it over. Tammy said, what are you gonna do to it? I said, just let her grow. <laughs> are you, did it embarrass you? It didn't embarrass me. I don't think he embarrassed dead men. <laughs> are you listening to me? They shave most prisoners' heads anyway when they go to jail. He was a prisoner. He was a powerful man. God help me. Would you pray for me? He was a preacher. You young people get a hold of verse number 11. I'm through. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ, Paul got into that, the mystery of the church, but he had a purpose in his life. He had a goal. He had a name. He had a purpose for his life, and that was to spend his life for Jesus. God called him to be the apostle to the Gentile. We know that going to suffer great things for me. Judas go down to the house of Ananias or Ananias to Judas. I believe Judas to Ananias or whatever. Go down there and you'll find him. He's been praying fasting for about three days and tell him I've got great things for him to do. I'm going to send him far hence to the Gentile. God's got a purpose for you. Let him take that ball of clay. Jeremiah 18, go down to the potter's house. He's doing a work on the wheel. And it's a lifetime work. None of us have arrived yet. I sure haven't. And so God's doing an eternal purpose, an eternal work in our life, shaping, molding, conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be like him one day. And then I thought about in verse number uh, uh, 14 and 15, and I'm closing. For this cause I bow my knees. It made him Paul the prayer. Paul the prayer. Are you listening to me? He wrote all those verses about pray without ceasing to the Thessalonians. He wrote to this church in 618 and said, pray evermore, pray everywhere. For Timothy, he wrote to a young preacher, Timothy, are you here? In chapter uh, two, chapter uh, book one, 
I exhort therefore that first of all prayer, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible said he gave himself a ransom for ALL and in the Greek that means for everybody. Amen. You may reject him, you may refuse to surrender to him, but he loved you so much that he went to Calvary and shed his life's given blood that you might be saved and Jesus prayed for you. He seated at the right hand of the Father. I'm persuaded he's still praying for a lost and dying world, wanting the church to get out of the confines of this building and reach the world with the gospel. That's why I'm running up and down the highway. That's why Miss Raines and I are doing what we're doing. God put me into what I'm doing. Amen. And so he was Paul the prayer. In the last verse of the chapter, he said in verse 21, unto him be glory in the church. I like it around here, don't you? Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Preacher, are you worried about the church dying? Well, he said there's going to be glory in the church, the world without end, throughout the ceaseless ages to come. We are going to be, and I'm not going to argue with you about doctrine. Now, you can argue if you want to. I don't have time. Amen. But God's got us as a bride of Christ. And what God had joined together, let not man put us under. Amen. And we're going to be the bride of Christ throughout the ceaseless ages to come. He'll say, here's that crowd that was yonder behind bars. They were in a horrible pit. Their life was in a mess. They didn't know what love was. They was raised on bitterness and hatefulness and wickedness and ungodliness. And my grace reached them and elevated them up, saved them by the grace of God. And I chose them to be my bride and maybe the grace of God will be magnified throughout ages to come world without end are you listening to me Paul the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ it's not easy this morning it's no gravy train it's no flowery bed of bees but there is coming a day when uh, There'll be no more separation, pain, death, and sorrow, and sickness. He said no more tears. Have you thought about no more tears? Every one of us in here shed tears. I shed tears this week. Chris's sister, and all of you know Chris. And, uh, she's, they were getting a di- uh, diagnosis or biopsies, getting read uh, this morning. Probably have already read them. But they were suspicious that it was going to be bad. And I wept over her. Sure. And I've wept with you when you've wept. And you've probably wept with me when me and my family have wept. Sure. You know what? That's love. Sure. And that love is going to keep growing, brother. We need, but those tears are going to dry up one of these days. Yeah. He's catching your tear, every tear that I've ever shed. He's, he's caught it in a bottle. Why in the world would the Lord want bottled tears? Well, one of these days, there ain't going to be none. Any English teachers in here? There ain't going to be none. Now, John, in the ceaseless ages to come, while the endless ages roll on, he's going to say, these are tears. They're going to say, what's that? From the heartbreak and pain and suffering that the church went through and I delivered them out of every one of them. This is what tears are all about. Are you listening to me? I'm glad I'm a prisoner. I'm glad God found me guilty and gave me a life sentence with no parole, amen, no pardon, no hope of ever getting out. I got in hook, line, and sinker, and I want to continue to be a prisoner. I want to continue to be a preacher. I got a purpose in my life. I want the power of God upon me. I want to keep praying, amen, and I ain't about to hang my harp on the willow tree, amen. I want to turn that thing around you. I like that preacher, thank God, and just while the age just roll on, keep on appraising him. Thank you, preacher, for that. Paul's cause. Have you got a cause? I hope you have. Amen, preacher. You can. Tell Paul and I didn't keep on and keep. 
keep on, but I guess I put everybody on a limit. I don't know what to tell you, Seth. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Here's the thing. First time I ever heard him, same way. Yeah. Yeah. Not, again, bad English, but ain't nothing changed. Yeah. Consistency. Yeah. This younger generation, they need a whole lot of that. Yeah. And it all goes back to what he said, being a prisoner. Yeah. Being a prisoner. Appreciate you being here. I really do. And please listen to me. Don't go down here to Wendy's and Wade's and all that. We've got Wade's right across the right across the way here. Um, we've got grilled chicken, and, and they've been slaving over that stuff, cooking all that by, on the grill. Baked potatoes, mixed vegetables, wheat rolls, pineapple cream cake. I wish I had somebody. <laughs> I'm in on that. Pineapple cream. Ooh, I'm going to say that again. Pineapple cream cake. God, that sounds good. And salad bar, all right? We want you to stay and eat. Don't go spend your money. Please don't. Brother Elder, would you, where do you, there he is. Come here and pray with us, if you will. Local pastor, Brother Wamper here. Brother Wamper, I don't think you've missed a service. Thank you. Brother from uh, Chesney. Um, I still can't hear you. Clay, I, I knew that. Yeah, I, I just want to refresh my memory. <laughs> So glad you're here. you local man. means a lot. There's probably, probably 75 churches within 25 miles of here. And we're fortunate to get three or four local pastors. I don't understand all that. But it don't matter. We're glad all of you's here. This is my little brother in Christ right here. It's my little brother. Come on, pray with me, little brother. And, and, and ask the blessing on the food. Sure ask will. The sure will. Let us pray. Our Father, we've been blessed this morning. Lord, we've heard from heaven. God, I pray that you'd bless the rest of this meeting. God, I pray that you'd let us have just a little bit more of what we've already seen here of you this morning. God, I pray that you'd bless the food and the fellowship to follow, Lord. I thank you for your son being glorified and lifted up in things this morning, Lord. We pray that you'd just help us now, and God, that you'd have us meet back in your building tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.